So today we will uh, focus on uh, the layer 2 aspect, which is primarily the module 3. So the layer 2, as you are aware, is the data link layer. And so we are going to understand the protocols behind data link layer. So if you look at um, data link layer, it could be classified into two sub layers, uh, two main functionalities that is involved in a data link layer, uh, primarily the data link control and the MAC, which is the media access control. So the two sub layers could be represented as DLC, which is data link control, which is going to be the focus of this particular lecture. And the next uh, discussions after CAT1 would primarily focus on the sub layer, which is on the media access control. So what are the functionalities involved in the data link layer? And uh, primarily focusing on DLC would be the focus of this particular lecture. So as you're aware, data link layer, uh, what does it do? What's the main functionality? It is responsible for delivery of frames from one hop to another which means from one you know one particular hop to the next hop device right so data link control if you look at is primarily going to work on you know framing uh, which be basically means that it's it's going to receive uh, the bit of streams from the higher layer the network layer and um, you know form a frame out of it uh, the framing primarily deals with adding the header and adding the trailer right so uh, this is the main thing so the adding the header is where the physical address of the source and the next top device is going to be added and the trailer is a very significant functionality that the data link control tries to do uh, which primarily deals with um, you know the capability whether the frame that you transmitted um, you know if it is damaged right you might have to have the mechanism to detect that the frame is a corrupted frame and all that right so the header is primarily a trailer is primarily going to be involved for error detection and the control aspects related to error detection so error control is one primary functionality of the data link control sub layer and flow control is another important functionality of the data link control so what is primarily flow control deals with is um, so the you know the rate at which right uh, the data is going to be sent right has to be controlled by the sender because um, you might be generating at one rate and the receiver should be able to absorb right the rate at which it's being sent across so if it's not able to do then it's actually going to overwhelm your receiver's buffer and hence the receiver sender has to have a capability to control the flow of rate of data so that it does not overwhelm the receiver's buffer. So that is the idea behind flow control. So we will look at that aspect later. So we're going to work on protocols, which is going to ensure that you work on both the aspect of not just doing error control, but also flow control, right? So between the sender and the receiver, between the hop to the next stop, right? Uh, when you deliver these frames, we have to ensure that you reliably transmit these frames between the nodes. So the node to node communication that you're doing, right, from one hop to the next hop, we have to ensure that the transmissions of the frame, right, um, is basically going to be reliable. So which means that uh, your physical layer is, is only going to, you know, transmit these raw bits encoded as signals. It's not going to look at the reliability aspect, right? But your data link control aspect has to look at whether uh, these frames which you are transmitting, if, even if it's damaged or lost, right, or, you know, it's a duplicate frame. So there should be mechanisms to basically detect that and ensure reliability is taken care. So that's the aspect that we are going to work on. Uh, primarily, this lecture is going to work on the error control aspects, right? And um, the next aspect would be on to discuss on flow control. The next sub layer is primarily on the medium access control, which is called the MAC protocols. So these are set of, again, uh, protocols where you need to ensure that um, when you have multiple devices using a shared media, right? So which means there's a common link. Say, for example, if you have a multi-point link, right, like the bus and all that, are in a wireless medium, which is basically a broadcast medium. And it's a shared media where you have multiple nodes trying to use that common link, right? You have to coordinate the access to the link. 
otherwise it could lead to signals being transmitted by multiple devices over the same time frequency and all that then it could lead to a mechanism called collision so we have to ensure that there is a coordination um, among these devices which are using the same media right and so the mac medium access control works on controlling the access to the medium when you have multiple devices accessing the same medium right so that's uh, there are several protocols that are being you know over the literature you know uh, proposed in the literature which could primarily be classified under three categories uh, one is called random access mac protocols uh, the second category of protocols is called controlled access MAC protocols and the third category of protocols is called channelization protocols. Uh, we will discuss in detail um, in the subsequent lectures. Uh, random access uh, primarily means that you know there is not going to be any control of which device is going to send the data if they have uh, data to send over the channel which is a common shared medium. Um, it's, it's going to be done in a random manner where there's always going to be uh, probability of collisions being done whereas controlled access is primarily that someone is going to control you there's always master and a slaves uh, who has to follow right uh, primarily uh, based on this mechanism of who can you know uh, go on to access the medium so channelization is not in the scope of the uh, syllabus uh, it's primarily deals with multiple access schemes like tdma fdma cdma uh, which should uh, is, is primarily the classification that comes under you know channelization protocols. So let's now uh, keep away MAC protocols discussion for now um, and focus more on to this aspect of error control mechanisms that could lead to ensuring that your frames are even though there is uh, you know errors in your transmission you have damaged frames being received which basically means corrupted frames being received you have to have mechanisms to detect that so you did you doing error detection and uh, you should have mechanisms for error correction as well so that's the focus we are going to work on error control protocols um, primarily two aspects uh, i can't directly correct the errors so i need to have a mechanism to detect errors i need to once detected that the frame that i have received is detected you know error i need to basically have mechanisms to correct that okay so when can these frames can get corrupted is during your transmission over your um, you know medium so this medium could primarily be your link right um, where uh, during your transmissions the data can get corrupted um, because when the bits flow over the you know noisy link which i call it as a noisy channel there could be interference uh, that could affect the shape of the signal and could corrupt um, one or more bits uh, that you're trying to transmit um, there could be applications which uh, you know can tolerate delay to some extent but uh, there are applications which uh, could not tolerate such kind of um, bits being corrupted or errored right uh, so say for example if you are doing an audio or um, you know video transmission a small amount of um, you know bits being corrupted um, some random errors could be tolerable um, because it's more on you know delay centric where you could tolerate uh, some aspect of errors um, but uh, whether, whether you're doing, when you're doing, um, you know, file uh, transmission and all that, say text and all this, you can't tolerate, um, you know, a bit being corrupted uh, because it's entirely going to change the meaning of your text and all that. Uh, so we have to look at, uh, depending on the application requirements, um, you know, uh, the error control mechanisms that are being incorporated um, and accordingly ensure that um, you're able to provide high level of accuracy when you try to transmit your data on over the noisy medium right so let's look at this now so we are going to discuss on what type of errors uh, are there um, when you're transmitting these uh, data units and um, the idea behind redundancy which is the core concept that is involved in uh, particularly for error detection as well as uh, correction. So let's uh, focus on um, you know what's the challenge that you have with reference to detection and uh, correction. 
Um, so we're going to deal with uh, primarily on coding schemes which are going to help you in detecting errors as well as correcting errors. So that's uh, the typical focus of this particular lecture. You might be aware of um, the ASCII encoding. So whatever be the medium of uh, you know, mode of transmission your data that you have, could be a text or a audio or a video. Um, so, um, you know, it's going to have some encoding format where it's going to be converted to a stream of bits. So ASCII is basically an 8-bit encoding scheme, um, which, uh, you know, where your stream of bits is now has to be transmitted over the, um, you know, noisy. So now you're looking at uh, types of errors. The types of errors primarily uh, is a single bit error. Um, or it could be a burst error. So what does it mean now? So um, we are primarily dealing with data units. Now what do you mean by data unit? Now every protocol deals with a data unit. Now when you look at the data link layer, the data unit that we are focusing here is the frames. Correct? So when I am transmitting a frame from one point to another, from one node to the next node, right? Um, and in that if I have uh, bits flowing over that link and could be subject to interference where there could be one or more bits that are getting corrupted. Now, if in that particular data unit, only one bit in that data unit has got changed or altered uh, because of the noise that is subjected to that, right? So that's basically a single bit error that we are uh, talking about. Um, so say for example, now on a serial data transmission that you're doing, um, on, on this data unit that you have and say you are transmitting at a rate of um, 1 Mbps, right? So the question now is um, in order for a single bit error to occur, right? Um, uh, the impulse noise that you have to correct just a single bit would be you have to look at this. Now you are transmitting data at a rate of 1 megabit per second, right? Which primarily means that 1 bit is going to occupy a duration of one microsecond, right? Um, so you need a noise duration of one microsecond to ultimately, you know, change um, your data, you know, one bit, uh, you know, zero to a one or a one to a zero, right? Uh, for this to corrupt. So this is quite rare to occur uh, where, you know, single bit error is only going to occur on a you know, particular data. Unit. So the most uh, likely thing that could happen the most likely thing that could happen is, is a burst error. Now look at this particular case. Now you have the data unit that we're talking about, whether it's a frame or a packet, right? And uh, just shape, you know, changing zero to one in that particular frame or a data unit, this is primarily called as, um, you know, single bit error. But if you, f the, the focus here is on burst error, which primarily means that in a data unit, if you have more than one bit error being corrupted, then that's basically called as burst error. Okay, so the burst error is, uh, is quite common um, and it's not necessary that uh, if I talk about a burst error in a data unit, it, uh, it's all contiguous bits uh, are being corrupted, right? It could occur, uh, you know, over the data unit. So um, we should have mechanisms to detect whether, uh, you know, if two or more bits in the data units have been corrupted or not. So in the case of uh, this particular example, if you look at uh, the sent uh, data unit or the frame that you have, right, um, and the received data unit, there is going to be corruption where there are two or more bits being corrupted, right? Uh, but the point when we're talking about, um, you know, burst error is um, our design mechanisms should be such a way that um, what could be the maximum burst error out of a data unit or say a frame that we would be able to detect, right? So uh, the metric that we are working on is uh, the burst error length, which uh, could be defined like this. Now say, um, I, I told you that it's not necessary that uh, your consecutive bits should be corrupted. So we are interested in the length of the burst error, which means uh, the first bit is in the sent word, if you look at, this is the first uh, bit that got corrupted and this is the last bit that got corrupted in your uh, send data unit. So we are looking at now here, it's not contiguous uh, bits being corrupted. So the length of the burst is uh, based on um, the last and the first consecutive bit you go on to calculate 
um, you know what's the length uh, that is there and suppose your mechanisms um, you know coding design has the mechanism to detect uh, up to say eight bits in this particular case then you should primarily be able to say that uh, your you know your error detection coding scheme is able to detect up to burst error of length eight now that's the limitation in your design so what is your design scheme which could be able to detect burst error of say length which primarily means that it could be um, you know um, any length from up to eight right so it's not necessary that it could be contiguous but uh, you should have that capability to design that so now uh, in this case if um, uh, you're transporting say um, you know uh, a data rate at a, a possible say one kilobits per second right so there are two aspects that is going to determine how many bits are going to be corrupted one is the duration of your noise your impulse noise if it's um, longer than one bit duration and the rate at which you are transmitting is going to tell you uh, what order of bits it's going to be corrupted suppose if your data rate is less right you're transmitting at 1 kb per second right and the noise is uh, you know one by hundredth of a second right uh, then uh, this could typically corrupt up to 10 bits right but if the same you are increasing the rate of transmission right it's up to one megabit per second and for the same noise duration of one by hundredth of the second there could be up to 10,000 bits that could be corrupted now this is the uh, worst case now um, duration of the noise as well as the rate of transmission is going to influence the number of bits that are going to be corrupted and depending upon the data unit that you're working on and the coding scheme that you used right the, that depends on that tells you what's going to be the length of the burst error max that you could detect that's going to be the limitation of your design right so we are going to work on schemes which is able to not just detect single bit errors but also uh, design um, schemes which where we could detect burst errors of you know say length n right so that's the focus of this particular lecture so the central concept um, for error control mechanisms primarily on to detect errors first and then possibly see if you can correct errors is working on this concept called redundancy so what do you mean by redundancy redundancy is something extra so what is that something extra that we're going to do here is you have your data unit um, you know that is received from the network layer you try to form the framing we're talking about this trailer part right so you're going to generate the trailer part which is some extra redundant bits that you're going to generate based on your data that you have received so the data bits that you have received there is going to be a kind of coding scheme encoding scheme that is going to come in where there is some relationship that you are going to bring in between the data units and your redundant bits right in order to generate your trailer part of the frame now these redundant bits is what is going to help you to you know uh, have the mechanism for error detection in your data unit right and accordingly see whether you could correct errors uh, whether by the schemes like forward error correction or by retransmission mechanisms so um, which one is easier now whether it error detection schemes are easier or error correction schemes are easier the answer obviously is error detection because um, when it comes to error detection who's going to detect the error right um, so the question comes there now if the sender is transmitting the data uh, which primarily is the frames that you're talking about uh, and the receiver is going to receive those frames which is the next stop device the receiver now needs to detect whether the received frames whether it is uh, you know received is it a corrupted or a damaged frame and all that so it's a receiver is going to do the error detection and he just have to say in a case of error detection whether the received frame is corrupted or not so it's only a primarily a yes or no answer whatever be the number of bits that are getting corrupted whether it's a single bit error or whether it's a burst error the answer is just going to be come on whether the received frame is received without errors that's it correct so whereas error correction it's going to be much more complex it's not an easier job because uh, the next part is once you have de decided detected that uh, the received frame is corrupted right you need to find out how many bits are corrupted in that particular data unit that's the first thing so firstly you need to know what's going to be the size of the message that you're talking about the data unit and then um, you know which bits are getting corrupted the position 
of the corrupted bits is uh, very important um, and uh, your scheme should have the mechanism of um, you know to correct that many number of errors let's look at uh, how complex it is say for example um, you have a 8 bit data unit right and you want to correct um, a single bit error happening uh, so primarily now your error detection will say that your data unit is due to the error correct but now you need to tell uh, out of that 8 bit uh, the position at which that particular the single bit has got corrupted and accordingly correct that bit so which means that you could possibly have um, eight possibilities there for in an 8-bit message to just correct one single bit error but just now look at the complexity suppose if you have to correct two bit errors in that particular 8-bit um, data unit what's all the possibility that you can have is now um, 8c2 right uh, combinations which primarily means that um, 807 divided by 2 into 1 it's it's going to be 28 possibilities that could come in so you need to now um, you know not just so deciding the you know finding out the position and having the mechanisms to correct uh, you know such two bit errors becomes complex um, you know as your size of the message and the number of errors that you want to correct if you look at thousand bit uh, message size right or your data unit size and you want to correct up to 10 errors now just imagine uh, the complexity that goes in you have to find 10 errors in a um, data unit of thousand units um, so the possibilities goes on to scale up um, and so you need it's it's the correction of uh, such many burst errors is going to be really complex right so um, uh, there are two ways that you can do uh, correction um, so we are primarily going to work on the second aspect the first aspect is called FEC schemes so which is called as forward error correction where the receiver first needs to once he has received the frame which is damaged or corrupted um, he has to guess what's the right uh, message using this concept of run and bits right um, so he not only detects but he also corrects himself by guessing the correct message right so this uh, is quite complex and uh, when the number of errors is small this might quite seem to be quite uh, simpler otherwise it's going to be really complex uh, the next uh, set of scheme is called the retransmission scheme which is the focus that we will be doing where uh, receiver will have this concept of redundancy for error detection but once he has detected the error uh, he has a sender to retransmit the frame right so um, here are again cases coming in the first case is this the receiver receives the frame and he receives the frame with um, you know errors um, how is he going to notify to the sender whether he has received the frame with errors or not right so an acknowledgement uh, that you go on to send to the sender um, if you have received a correct frame right without errors is this going to be a positive acknowledgement correct uh, but the, in the case when you have received a frame with errors um, there should be a mechanism to notify the sender that um, you know you have received a corrupted frame so there are two ways to do that one is you need to send a negative acknowledgement telling that you received uh, without any you received a corrupted frame or you remain silent by not sending an acknowledgement right so the latter is something that we try to focus here primarily where uh, if you got a corrupted frame you're not going to send an acknowledgement um, so the sender keeps waiting for an acknowledgement but how long can he wait for the acknowledgement is the next question so there could be a timer running where he could wait till for some time and then if he's not receiving an acknowledgement uh, which I would say uh, more than twice the round trip delay right um, so he could go on to have the timer timed out and he could go on to retransmit now what is the guarantee that when I retransmit that frame over the noisy channel uh, it's again going to be received without errors right uh, there's no guarantee for that right so the protocol clearly says that how many retry attempts that you can do um, you know exceeding that particular number of atoms you go on to basically about your transmission so some standards specify say you retry for three times you retry for seven times um, you know beyond that if you're not able to do you go on top of so there's something really wrong either on the channel or on the you know the perspective so this is these are the challenges that you have um, when you're dealing with retransmission schemes uh, which we will focus on 
but let's now work on how are you generating this concept of redundancy uh, what are the coding schemes that you can use to basically design um, you know proper um, you know uh, coding uh, mechanisms in order to detect errors okay so the discussion is this uh, the coding schemes that you're working going to work on is primarily on block coding there's another category of coding schemes called conventional coding which we are not going to um, you know it's not going to be a part of our syllabus so block coding is something that we're going to do which means that um, you're going to generate redundant bits out of your actual data bits and append those redundant bits to the actual data bits right so that's the extra bit that you're going to add but that's primarily generated from your actual bits only so there is a relationship that you're going to bring in and for that you're going to uh, design block code schemes which is going to generate this written bits out of your actual data bits so this is primarily the structure of the encoder and the decoder that you see um, where another sender which wants to transmit the message right um, has to have this encoder right uh, where there is going to be a generator algorithm right this generator algorithm is, is where you are going to generate your redundant bits out of your actual bits and um, you are going to append that redundant bit to your message right that's the trailer path that you are talking about and this is particularly the one that you are going to transmit over your you know noisy link which is basically an unreliable medium so the received information uh, by the receiver that is the received frame that is going to be there right is going to be subjected to a checker algorithm which uh, knows what is that coding scheme that you have used right so that it could go on to check based on um, you know the received code word received word whether it is a errored frame or not and if it's basically a uh, non-error uh, frame you could go on to discard the trailer part and take the message out of it and deliver it to your higher layer right so it is very important to know what kind of a coding scheme that you're using to generate the redundant bits because the relationship between your data unit and the redundant bit right the number of redundant bits that you're going to generate based on your actual message all these are the factors that is going to influence you your error detecting capability okay so and the receiver and the sender should be in sync of knowing what kind of coding schemes it is receiving on so that the receiver is going to do the same in the reverse uh, side to check whether your received frames is basically um, you know received without errors and all that if how much errors are there uh, and see if you could you know detect and correct these errors right So we are primarily going to work on um, modulo in arithmetic um, in this. So as you know that modulo is basically something where um, you know the reminder of that right um, is going to be in the range of 0 to n minus 1 right. Um, so here we are dealing with bits and so it's primarily a mod 2 arithmetic that we're doing um, which means it's going to be only inclusive of 0 and 1 right. And so we are going to deal with XOR operations primarily to generate our redundant bits, right? So that's the mod 2 arithmetic for you that uh, is going to be the focus for our coding schemes. Okay, so as you know, what does XOR does? If two bits are the same, the result is zero. If two bits are different, the result is one, right? Whether it's um, an addition or subtraction, uh, XORing operation is going to be uh, the same uh, that's going to happen. So working on block coding schemes, the idea behind block coding is, um, you know, why is it called blocks? Now let's analyze that. So now that um, we are going to deal with block of data, right? So say if you divide your message into blocks and the first criteria is this, the blocks are of fixed size, right? Which is called, you know, each say of k bits. So I'm going to use two terminologies here. Uh, I'm going to use a terminology called data word right and i'm going to use a terminology called code words so whatever data unit that i'm talking about is going to be dealt in terms of the blocks and these data units are of size k bits which are called as a data bits right data words so which means if you have k bits uh, the number of possible data words that you could have is 2 power k 
data words, correct? So for every data word that you have, um, you are going to generate some redundant bits, right? So how many redundant bits that you're going to add is say you're going to add R redundant bits to every block. So what happens now is the generated, um, your generator is going to generate the R redundant bits out of these K bits data unit that you have. And the, you know, the generated one is going to be called as a code word, right? And the code word say is of length N. And so you know that N is going to be greater than K, which is your data word uh, length, and N is your code word length. Um, and so what is N is primarily, uh, you have your data word plus your redundant bits that you go on to add, which is R. So the length of your code word is going to be N um, compared to your data word, which is going to be of K. When it comes to block coding, what are we doing is we are dealing with um, these blocks of fixed size of K bits. We're going to generate R bits based on this K bits and we're going to append that to get our code word. So the block coding is primarily a one to one mapping scheme, which means for every same data word, it's going to be always encoded to the same code word. So how many possible code words you can have is out of your N um, you know, bits for your code word, you could have two power possible code word combinations. And since I said it's a one to one mapping, which means for the same data word, it's going to be encoded to the same code word, right? You have two power uh, K possible data words and two power N possible, uh, you know, code words. Uh, if you, it's going to be a one to one mapping, then it primarily means that um, you are going to have some code words which are not going to be mapped at all. So, uh, the code words uh, that are not going to be mapped is you need to subtract from the data word. So 2 power n minus 2 power k uh, remaining words, code words are not going to be used, correct? So you say, for example, suppose if I use a k value of, um, you know, 2 and code word um, n is 3, which primarily means that you're going to have just four possible combinations of data word, uh, which is going to be mapped to four code words which means that out of the eight uh, possible code words that you can have, you're only going to use four code words and the other four code words are not going to be used. But the real aspect is this, how are you going to generate the R redundant bits, right? What's the relationship between your data word and code word is primarily on the encoding scheme that you're going to use to generate those R redundant bits. And how many number of uh, redundant bits that you're going to generate? And this coding scheme is primarily going to help you telling your error detection capability. And both the sender and the receiver in terms of its encoding and the decoding algorithm is going to use the same uh, policy of coding so that they could understand what is the value of N or what is the value of K and what is the relationship of the coding scheme that you use to generate that R so that they know what is all the valid possible code data words or code words and primarily have the mechanism for error detection. So this is that we were discussing. So if you have a K bit uh, data word, uh, we could have possibly two power K data words. And um, um, in you having two power N code words um, out of the N bits that you have, only two power K of them are going to be valid in terms of your block coding schemes. So let's now work on a particular example. Um, we could use, uh, you know, notations like this. Say I'm using a 4B slash 5B coding scheme. And what does it mean is, um, you know, B is the block coding that you're talking about. So the data word is of size, what? Four, and your code word is of size, what? Five, which basically means that uh, K is four and your N is basically five, which means how many possible code words, uh, data words you can have is you could have 16 data words and you map it to 16 code words out of the possible 32 code words that you have, right? So that's primarily going to be used. Those 16 data words is primarily uh, going to be used. Uh, 16 code words are primarily going to be used for the message transfer and the rest are going to be unused. So let's now look at uh, much more in depth. Uh, how are you going to generate your R bits? What's the mapping uh, you know, logic that we're going to have um, is, is going to be the next set of discussion. So uh, looking at this particular picture, it's now much more clearer um, in terms of the specifics that you have. Uh, say you have the sender, which is uh, going to do the encoding. 
So the message that you're talking about, the data unit that you're talking about, we're going to call it as a data word. It's of size k bits. What is the generator going to do? The generator is something, yeah. Now the sender and the receiver follows the kind of a coding scheme, which knows what is that uh, mechanism that you use to generate the redundant words. Right, and so the generator goes on to basically generate uh, the redundant bits and going to form a code word of size n bits, which is equal to k plus r. Right now, he's going to transmit this code word over the noisy link. You know that the receiver could have the received code word, which primarily is not going to be equal to your sent code word in the case where the bits are getting corrupted. And so the receiver has to do the process where he has to check whether the received code word is received without errors or not. Right. So how does he comes to that conclusion is firstly, you need to know for your block coding, what is all the possible data words that you have, which means that if you know the size of the data word, you know the possible combinations of the data word and you know if the relationship with what's between the redundant bit and the data word. Uh, you could know what's all the possible code words that you could have, right? So I'm going to call these things. You know what's all the list of valid code words that you can have. And if you received a code word, right, which is corrupted and it does not match to the list of valid code words, then what does it primarily means is you are basically going to detect error there, which means you're going to discard that. But if your received code word is one of the valid code words, you go on to you know uh, take that kind of case that okay I've received uh, a proper frame without errors, right? And you go on to extract that data bits out of it and deliver it to your uh, deliver the data word to your higher layer. So this is the case. But there there are limitations in this, right? Uh, the limitation is suppose you have more errors happening and um, your checker is not able to detect that uh, particular case primarily because um, a particular set of bits getting corrupted and the received code word maps on to another valid code word which you didn't expect and so you think that you have received the frame without any errors and you go on to do that but that's uh, going to be a problem so your problem is this what is the kind of uh, block coding scheme that you're deploying um, how many redundant bits that you're generating? What is the max error detecting capability of that? Right? Um, beyond which, if you have errors happening, uh, what happens is your receiver can go on to possibly mistake that, uh, taking that as an other valid code word, uh, which could uh, you know possibly affect your you know, scheme there. So this is uh, there are drawbacks. So uh, the design of your scheme is going to be very very important. So in this particular case, we we said that we will be able to detect a single bit error, but not able to detect two bit error or more. But let's see whether there is an error correcting capability of this. Say you're transmitting, you have the data word, uh, you know, zero one, and um, you know you are uh, transmitting this code word zero one one over the medium, but the received code word is say zero one zero, right? which means that uh, this particular third bit got corrupted, you are able to basically find out that it does not match in any one of these valid code words. And so you've received a uh, corrupted one. But now to find out which particular bit has got corrupted, will you be able to do that decision? That's the um, real problem here. Now what, uh, as a layman, what you could try to do is, you will try to see which one is the closest match. Say I take this received code word and I try to match with the first one. I find that uh, there is a difference in the second bit, right? Uh, so there is a one bit difference in the in a match with the first code word. If I took the second code word, I find that there is again one bit difference, which could be the which primarily is the third bit. In the case of the third code word, if I see there are uh, you know more differences right from the first, second, and the third. In the case of the fourth one, there is the first bit, there is a difference. So I have now an ambiguity where it could either be the closest match if you look at, could either be the first, second, or the third, but I can't make a concrete decision that which one could be the possible case. So you do not have uh, error correction capability here because of the ambiguity of the choices, right? But uh, but let's now take this particular case where you have more redundant bits being generated. 
and let's see how the error detecting and the capability uh, correction capability is improved when you generate more redundant bits out of your data word so let's take the case suppose you have 0 1 and uh, some design you have generated this code word 0 1 0 1 1 right so this 0 1 0 1 1 transmitted over the link right uh, now the link is being received as 0 1 0 0 1 so what does it mean now there is this particular fourth bit uh, which is corrupted right now what we're going to do now is the receiver you know that is going to apply the checker algorithm to see if it's the received as matches with one of the valid code words So we were able to correctly uh, find out what was the you know, received uh, code word um, uh, even though it has been corrupted right? and uh, able to correctly find out the code, uh, data word from that uh, code word. Right? So what's the primary concept in um, error control is uh, on this uh, you know, proposal by Hamming which is called as the Hamming distance. So this having distance something, you know, is a symmetric which tells you about the error detecting as well as the correcting capability of a particular coding scheme. So this is nothing. What we ideally did that is uh, we were trying to compute the uh, distance between the received code word, right, and the valid code word, right. So what is that distance is uh, you have two code words of the same size you're basically going to find out the number of distance difference the number of difference between the corresponding bits right of the code words so that is what you're going to do so how are you going to do you're just going to do a, apply an xr of this code words and count the number of ones which primarily tells you the hamming distance so based on this hamming distance which acts as a criteria to tell that um, you know what is going to be the error detecting and error correcting capability you were able to design schemes and telling that what could be primarily the deduction capability of that. So let's look at the examples that we had. Say for example, uh, if you take the first table where we had a 3 comma 2 and say I take um, any two code words and uh, you want to find the difference. So say 0, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 1, you go on to take the differences. You could just like that say it's uh, 2. But you're primarily doing an XOR between the uh, corresponding bits and counting the number of ones and so having distance in this case is two similarly if you take the second table and uh, say for these case you are you are uh, counting the number of dif difference between the corresponding words uh, bits right uh, you go on to find out that uh, uh, having distance is primarily three in this case so what what is uh, the error detecting capability is something based on this having distance so for a particular coding scheme if you want to tell what is the guaranteed error detection capability you will have to come up with uh, a criteria based on the hamming distance which is called the minimum hamming distance so what do you mean by minimum hamming distance is that see what we are now going to do is we are going to find out among all the possible valid code words right uh, you have to take uh, the hamming distance for every possible pair of valid code words and find out what is the smallest hamming distance among all this possible pair of code words so that is called as a minimum hamming distance this minimum hamming distance is going to be the uh, criteria that is going to tell you what is going to be your error detecting capability or the error uh, correcting capability so that's the measurement that we are going to use so once you come up with a you know coding scheme uh, like a block coding scheme where you're going to generate end bits you could go on to find out what's the hamming distance based on that and compute the minimum hamming distance among all the possible hamming distances and say this could be the error detecting or the correcting capability of a particular coding scheme so in this case uh, particular uh, even parity single bit parity uh, detection or uh, generation you know that uh, hamming distance if you go on to take between every possible combinations how many are there so which uh, you have four co uh, code words right so you go on to take all the possible combinations coming into that right um, so if you take the difference it's primarily going to be two so between one two one three one four or two three or two four or uh, you know three four uh, three one that's coming in so uh, all these cases if you look at so yeah it's it's totally you know six cases that that would come in 
So the Hamming distance is going to be 2 in this case. So the minimum Hamming distance which I represent by d min is going to be 2. Right. So what is this going to tell you is going to indirectly tell you what's going to be the error detecting and error correcting capability. One. Um, so this is the case that we did for calculating the minimum Hamming distance. Let's try to analyze for the second table. If you look at the second table, um, in the second table, the Hamming distance between the first and the second one is 3, between this and this is 3, between this and this is 4, right? And uh, between the second and the third is again what? Is going to be 4, second and fourth is going to be uh, 3. So the minimum among all that is going to be 3. So the Hamming distance for this particular uh, design is going to be 3. So based on the Hamming distance, we have to arrive at what's the error detecting or the error correcting capability. So this is the calculation that you've seen for this, um, where the minimum Hamming distance is 3. So now let's come to the case. Suppose you wanted to do a guaranteed error detection of up to S errors, right? Uh, so in that scenario, the minimum Hamming distance in your block code that you're designing should be at least S plus one. So what does it mean now? If you want to detect S errors guaranteed, your minimum Hamming distance in your code block codes should basically be S plus 1. So you want to uh, do a guaranteed detection of, um, you know, at least one error. You have to have the minimum Hamming distance as 2. So that's the case. Now, so for the first table that we had where the demon was 2, right, what, what does it mean that? It means that you can only do a guaranteed error detection of up to 1 bit. Right. Can you do a guaranteed extra of 2 bit? No, in that case. Right. So, but whereas the second table where we saw the minimum uh, Hamming distance as 3 in that scheme, the guaranteed error detection is up to 2 errors. Right. Which means you could do a guaranteed error detection of 1 or 2 errors, but not more than that. Right. So, what primarily happens is that if you have, um, you know, 2 or more errors happening, up to 2 errors is fine. But if you have, uh, so the first table we had the D minus 2. So, in case if there were two errors happening, two bit errors, you saw that the received code word primarily goes on to map to another valid code word. So, that is a problem. So, that's the limitation. And so, Hamming distance metric basically helps to uh, tell you what's your uh, error detecting capability that comes. So, the table one we said uh, could guarantee the detection of um, only a single bit error. Uh, but not uh, if you have a two bit error, it could or more, it could possibly lead to um, you know getting matched with uh, one of the valid code words. Similarly, for this particular case, um, if you have uh, you know two errors happening, right? Um, say you are receiving you are transmitting um, you know 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, uh, and you're receiving it as say 0 1 um, 0 0 0 right so which means there is a two bit error happening and you know that it is not matching with any of the valid code which you are still able to detect so you were able to do a guaranteed error detection here even though it is two errors but now assume that instead of 0 1 0 0 0 you received it as 0 0 0 0 0 uh, where primarily there are three errors happening, it has matched to one of the valid code words. So it was not able to do a guaranteed detection of three errors or more than that. So that is the limitation in this particular design that you have. So the combination of three errors basically changed, um, you know, to another valid code word. And so you were not able to detect uh, despite errors happening. So we could also uh, we could try this uh, to understand geometrically also uh, where um, you know say the sent code word um, is x okay so this is one of the valid code word x and the received code word uh, you know uh, if it falls within the territory uh, with geometrically with say a circle all these pink dots that you see um, are uh, the possible received code word which is corrupted but if it's bounded within this uh, circular territory uh, means that uh, the circle is of radius yes uh, so if uh, you have errors 
happening uh, which are bounded between 1 to up to s which means on the peri uh, perimeter of the circle you have a maximum of s is happening you will be able to detect that uh, uh, you know this received uh, code word is basically corrupted uh, so uh, but the, the primary case is this um, the received code word should not be erroneously being mistaken as another valid code word say y so for that particular case happening the valid code word should be outside the circle correct so which means that uh, the distance of separation between the valid code word if i need to do a guaranteed detection of up to s errors even though the zip code is on um, you know the radius yes which means yes errors has happened uh, should be an integer greater than yes right so the demon should be at least greater than yes or it should be primarily s plus one so that's the discussion that we are talking in terms of the having distance between the valid code words so that even though if you have errors uh, up to s errors happening uh, it does not match to another valid code word why this particular case so but yeah so that limits your design so if you have more than errors happening uh, beyond that then you will not be able to detect because your design scheme can only do a guaranteed detection of up to s errors this could also be extended geometrically to explain what is going to be the error correction now for the error correction do you think that uh, you could do with the same possible hamming distance the answer is no right because you have to make a decision of which uh, you know uh, possible valid code word it could be that means you are doing a guess based on your received code word once you have detected there is an error right so for that case let's now extend this uh, geometry concept so the geometry concept could be extended like this now every valid code word is going to have its own territory right uh, so um, if i know you need to do a guaranteed error correction say of up to t radius right now the possibility is this you know that um, um, you know suppose if you every uh, valid code word if you represent by a circle and um, these two circles are overlapping what could be the problem is uh, say i say that i could do a guaranteed detection of uh, up to t errors but the point now is uh, if uh, there are t errors happening then uh, the distance between these two is going to be the same so i do not know whether the received code word belongs to this particular valid code word or this particular valid code word so in that scenario now the hamming distance for error correction becomes slightly complex which means that if i need to do a guaranteed error correction of up to t bits that is happening right um, which uh, means that my having distance should be at least greater than right the integer greater than 2t so it should be at least 2t plus 1 so that my um, you know received code word is not going to be matched to any of uh, one of the valid code words right so because of the ambiguity that you have so the demon should be at least 2t plus 1 for a guaranteed error correction of up to t bits right so that is the case that we're talking about so the conclusion here is this to guarantee correction of up to t errors the minimum hamming distance in a block code must be demon equal to 2t plus 1 but if you just want to do a detection right it is enough that uh, if you want to detect up to s errors right you could have uh, the hamming distance as s plus 1 so that it does not match with another valid code word but you have to make a decision now that particular code word that you have received is primarily this particular valid code word and every code word has its own territory for you know its own correction and uh, detection so you will have to ensure that um, when you are having distance the blocker should be 2t plus 1 if you want to do a correction of up to t errors. So let's look at this uh, particular example. Suppose you have a coding scheme which has a hamming distance d min equal to 4. So the, what does that primarily means is that uh, what's the error detection capability of this particular scheme and what's the correction capability of the scheme. So if you have d min as 4, what, uh, how many errors is guaranteed to be detected is uh, you know that uh, if you need to have uh, detect up to s errors, your new hamming distance should be uh, s plus 1 so you could do a guaranteed error detection of up to 3 errors but uh, can you do a correction of up to 3 errors no it's not possible so which means that uh, if you need to if you have a demon of 4 
um, so the correcting capability is uh, 2t plus 1 which means that if t is 1 right uh, you will have your hamming distance as uh, 3 if t is 2 you will have your hamming distance of 5 so it's in the scale of odd so here um, you are only having a part of the capability is wasted here so for error correction you could only correct up to one error uh, you could detect guaranteed detection up to three errors but uh, in a case uh, you want to do a correction you can only do a correction of one bit error that is happening so part of its capability is being wasted so the error corrections needs to have odd minimum distances whether it is going to be you know three or five or so on right so this is uh, one example so it can correct up to uh, only one error cases uh, and not more than uh, one error cases so uh, we'll end this discussion with this the next topic of discussion will be on linear block codes okay